Somebody say amen. 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 What a gift. What a gift. Amen. Mm, mm, mm. That's good. If you have a Bible, go with me to the book of Colossians chapter 1. Have your device, your iPad, your iPhone, or you can see it on the screen. If you're new to our church, if you're watching online, welcome. My name is Rich. I have the privilege of serving as a lead pastor of New Life Fellowship Church. If you're new to our church and we've never met before, I'd love to meet you at the end of our service. Uh, Some of our pastors and leaders will be down there, and so if we've never connected before, uh, make your way to us. We'd love to see you before you head out. We are in this series through the book of Colossians. My hope is that we are reading the book of Colossians as a church family together over the next six months. And what's interesting about the book of Colossians is the Apostle Paul, who's writing this letter to this church, he didn't start this church. Usually many of the churches that Paul writes to in the New Testament, he started them and then he writes a letter to them about uh, how they are to keep going in the way of Jesus. But in this case, a guy named Epaphras started the church, a faithful minister of the gospel. But what began to happen was the people of God started to drift away from Jesus. And so Epaphras reached out to Paul and said, I need some help. Epaphras reached out to Paul and basically said, can you help us to get back on track in our relationship with Jesus? And so Paul writes this letter to the book of the Colossians about uh, what it means to be aligned in Jesus Christ. And so today we're going to focus on a particular passage of scripture that is regarded by the church as a hymn, as a poem about Jesus talking about who he is and what he does and why this is good news for all of us. And so Colossians chapter 1, beginning in verse 15, you can follow on your phone, your devices on the screen, hear the word of the Lord. Paul says, the Son, that is Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, Visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things. Amen. And in him, all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in Everything. Let me hear you say everything. everything. Everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. That's who Jesus is. Let's pray. Lord, give us ears to hear and eyes to see and a heart to receive everything the Holy Spirit has for us this day. May we get a fresh revelation of who Jesus is. We pray these things in the name of Jesus and everyone said, amen. Amen. When it comes to the spiritual life, there are many temptations that all of us will inevitably face. There are temptations as it relates to money, There's temptations as it relates to the misuse of power. There's temptations as it relates to sexuality. There's all kinds of temptations that come our way in a given day, in a given week, in a given month, in a given year. But there's a temptation that's so universal, but at the same time often so undetectable. It's a temptation that all of us experience from time to time. It's a temptation that I'm very familiar with. It's a temptation that you might be familiar with. But it's a temptation that all of us, from one time to another, will experience. It's the temptation to lose the wonder of God. The temptation that every one of us have to lose the awe of God, to lose wonder of God. This is why in the book of Proverbs, the Proverbs writer says over and over again that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And when the Proverbs writer said those words, he didn't mean that the fear of the Lord meant that we are to be afraid of God. The fear of the Lord is wonder of God. It's it's awe of God. It's recognizing that God is who God is and there's no one like God. To recognize that there's wonder and awe and the temptation that you and I have is to lose that. To lose the wonder and the awe of God. 
Wonder is about surprise. It's about awe uh, the, the, the pe that, that people feel when perceiving something rare or unexpected. What does wonder look like? Let me show you what wonder looks like. That's what wonder looks like. And it is very easy to lose the wonder that God has filled us with. At different points in our lives, we will all experience wonder. When I was 13 years of age and I had my first airplane ride and we took off, that was my face, wonder. When I saw the Grand Canyon for the first time in 2019 and saw the vastness of it, that was my face, wonder. When Rosie started walking down the aisle on January 28th, about 12.07 p.m. Come on, somebody. That was my face. Wonder. When I held my children for the first time after Rosie gave birth to them, holding them in my hands, just absolute wonder. When I tasted the love of Jesus Christ for the first time in 1999, and that love transformed my heart. What did I feel? Wonder. We all from time to time know what it's like to experience wonder and the temptation of our lives is to lose the wonder, to lose the awe, especially in our text today, to lose the awe of perceiving and realizing who Jesus really is. And yet this is a challenge in the Bible and in our lives that we have to lose and to misunderstand and to not really understand who Jesus is. What's fascinating about the Bible is that the demons in the Bible had more discernment than the disciples in the Bible. The demons, when they would encounter Jesus, when Jesus would enter into the room, the, the demons would look at him and say, I know who you are. And they would be in awe and trembling before him. But when Jesus did a, a, a miracle and made the, the wind stop and the storm cease, the disciples look at him and go, who is this guy? The demons know who he is. The disciples are often confused about who Jesus is. They don't realize everything he is, and that happens to us as well. And so what we need desperately, friends, is a fresh revelation of who God is. What we need is a deepening of awe, a deepening of wonder, a recognition that the God who created you, the God who sustains you, the God who pours out grace and mercy on your life is worthy of wonder, worthy of awe. And this is what Paul says in the book of Colossians. The Apostle Paul is trying to help a drifting church to get back into alignment with Jesus Christ. And so Paul begins his letter to the Colossians with a prologue, with a prologue. And in this prologue, the beginning of the letter, Paul writes these words, grace and peace to you. And last week we talked about the importance of these words, grace and peace. Paul, before he does anything, he writes grace and peace. When he, when he meets someone, it is grace and peace. And I mentioned last week, imagine if the first thing we said every morning was grace and peace. What if the first time we saw our spouse, we saw our children, we say grace and peace. The first time we go into the office, we say grace and peace. When you go into the subway, you say grace and peace. And Lord knows we need a lot of grace and peace in the subway. Paul begins with his prologue by saying grace and peace. And then Paul moves from prologue into prayer. Prologue, prayer. And in the prayer, he's praying for the Colossian church in the same way that I'm praying for you, in the same way that Jesus is praying for you. Pray that you would be filled with the knowledge of God. Filled that you, uh, praying that you would live your life with thanksgiving, that you would live your life oriented towards Jesus and aligned with his heart. Paul goes from prologue to prayer, and now we have a poem. Prologue, prayer, poem. And Paul begins to talk about who Jesus is. And why we should be in awe of him. And what Paul begins to do is he, be, he begins to list Jesus' resume. And boy, it's an amazing resume. You're not going to find a resume like this. And the first thing Paul says is that when, you, when we think about Jesus, the first thing he says is that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. The image of the invisible God. That is to say that if you want to know what God is like, Look no further than to Jesus. 
When you ask the world, what is, who is God like? What is God like? There's so many different answers that we can have. But what Paul is saying is, when you look to Jesus, that's how we know what God is like. It was Brian Zahn, a, a pastor, who said, God is like Jesus. God has always been like Jesus. There has never been a time when God was not like Jesus. We haven't always known it, but now we do. Jesus is the image, the exact representation of the invisible God. And so if you want to know God, you got to get to know Jesus because he's the image of the invisible God. Paul continues. He says, he says if that's not enough, he says he is the firstborn over all creation. Amen. Amen. And when Paul says this, what he's not saying, he's not saying that Jesus is the first one who's created by God. He's not saying he's the firstborn as if to say that Jesus didn't exist at a particular time. No, in the Gospel of John chapter 1, it talks about Jesus and says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. To say this is not to say that Jesus was the first being who was created. In some traditions and some, and, and some religious sects, for example, like the Jehovah's Witnesses, they would interpret the firstborn to mean the first created one. But that's not what Paul is saying here. Paul is saying this is language of preeminence. For example, in, in Psalm 89, it says, I have found David my servant. With my holy oil, I have anointed him. I also shall make him my firstborn. What's important about this is David, if you know the story, was not the firstborn. David was the youngest one. And when he's talking about David being my firstborn, he's not talking about order of birth. He's not talking about chronology. He's talking about preeminence. He's saying David, even though he's the youngest one, is now my preeminent one. He's my anointed one. And what, Je what Paul is saying about Jesus is not that he's the first created being in the world. No, no, no. Everything was created through him, and everything was created for him. But what he's saying is Jesus is the preeminent one, that there is no one above Jesus Christ. That there's no one like him. There's no one who's more supreme than he is. There's no one who's more sufficient than he is. And it's common and in sports and in movies and in culture to debate who's the best, who's the better, who's the supreme. For example, we can have this conversation throughout eternity, and the conversations that's been had is, is who's better? Is it Michael Jordan who's better, or is it LeBron James who's better? And this is a conversation that will last throughout eternity. The conversation of, is it, is it Messi who's better or is it Ronaldo? Who's the all-time best player? And I know you have your opinions. I know you have your opinions. Uh, but, but this is a debate that will go on for a long, long time. Is Dunkin' Donuts better or is it Starbucks better? And some of you are like, neither. I, I got something else. I got something else. But, but we have this debate. Which one is better? Is Robert De Niro better than Al Pacino? I, I, mean, I mean, who's the better actor? I mean, I mean, I mean we're going to fight about this, aren't we? Is it Coke or is it Pepsi? It's Coke. I, I, that's, that's, that's clear about it there. What's better? Is it Chicago-style pizza, or is it a New York slice of pizza? You already know. You already know. Brother Don Charles from Chicago. I won't hold that against him, but Brother Don Charles from Chicago. And let me tell you, last year, for the first time ever, I went to Chicago. I had a deep dish pizza. That thing was amazing. I want to tell you, that thing was, and so I went on social media. I said, I, after the second, I said, I got a tweet about this. And so, and so I said, that Chicago pizza was amazing, remarkable, delicious, dot, dot, dot. But it wasn't New York City pizza. It wasn't New York City pizza. People got upset about that. People got upset about that. We can debate endlessly, brothers and sisters, about so many different things, but the Apostle Paul is letting us know if there's one thing that there's no debate about is who's better than Jesus Christ. There is no one like Jesus Christ. 
Amen. No one can heal like Jesus. No one can save like Jesus. No one can forgive like Jesus. No one can restore like Jesus Christ. He is, amen, the preeminent one, the supreme one, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And so Paul says he is the firstborn over all creation. He then says he is the head of the body, the church. In other words, there's, there's no personality that's running this thing. The one who's head of the church is Jesus Christ. No personality, no pastor, no group. It is Jesus Christ who is the head of the church. He is the, he is the beginning and the firstborn from the dead. This is who Jesus is. And so he's more than just a carpenter's son. He's more than just a teacher. He's more than just a healer. He is the exact representation. He is the image, amen, of the invisible God. And so Paul says, I want you to get the wonder of who we're talking about. The one who sustains everything is Jesus Christ. And our wonder, the awe for Jesus is to deepen. That's my hope for us today. That's my prayer for you today. That when you think about Jesus, you're not just thinking about, oh, a, a, a side spiritual thing that I do on Sundays from time to time. That our lives will be filled with awe and wonder at the mention of his name. Amen. That our lives will be filled with awe and wonder when we read about him in the gospel. That our lives will be filled with awe and wonder when we take a moment to pray in the name of Jesus. That our lives will be filled with awe and wonder because of him. Paul says, this is who Jesus is. And then he says, this is what Jesus does. He is before all things. And in him, all things hold together. He is before all things, and in him, all things hold together. Now, we have scientific language about why things are in their place, why the stars are in their place. We have the language of science. We have the language of physics. Why is the earth positioned as the earth is positioned right here, right now, the distance from the sun, where we can't burn and we're not going to freeze? We're just where we need to be. Why are the, the stars in the sky? The air that we breathe. We have scientific language for this, but Paul lets us know behind all of this, behind all the science that we have, behind all the physics that we have, he offers a theological point that we must hold on to. It is Jesus Christ who's holding all of this together. And if Jesus is before all things and in him all things hold together, this is good news for our lives in a number of ways. And I want to outline, why is this good news? Why is it good news that Jesus is holding everything together? Well, first of all, here's the good news. If Jesus is holding it all together, that means you can stop trying to. Come on, somebody. Here's my hope. My hope is that you'll be able to take a deep breath. Ah, I'm not holding it all together. And every time I try to attempt to hold it all together, I don't have the capacity to hold it all together. This, is, this truth is to help us recognize our God-given limits. That we can't do it all, all the time. What is this supposed to do? It's to help us rest. Amen. It's to help us go, you know what? My body can't keep going at the rate that it is going. I can't keep on putting things on my plate over and over again. There's a time where I need to say, I can't hold it all together, but Jesus can. Therefore, let me step away. For some of you, you've had a hard time stepping away. For some of you, you keep putting stuff on your plate over and over again. And week in and week out, you find yourself crushed by the weight of the world. And here's the invitation for us. Because he's holding it together, you don't have to. We need this word, don't we? Because I know what it's like if I can use language of psychology to overfunction. To overfunction is to do for someone what they can and should do for themselves. Are you with me? 
And I know what it's like to live life doing for someone what they can and should do for themselves and then get resentful about it. This is to help us not overfunction. This is to help us recognize Jesus is holding it all together. Now, let me just nuance this for a second. This verse doesn't mean that we're not to be responsible. Amen. This is not an appeal to irresponsibility. This verse is an appeal to recognizing the responsibility that is rightly ours, but noticing all the ways that we cross the line, the, cr the ways that we cross the line when we go way beyond what God has called us to do, to try to be for others something that God never called us to be, to try to carry for ourselves and for others what God never called you to carry. It is so easy to live our lives crushed under the burden of trying to be Jesus, but there's only one Jesus. And in him, all things hold together. And if Jesus is holding it together, holding all things together, do you know what that includes? You. That includes your life. Some of you this past week, maybe you came into church wondering, you feel like you're being... You're falling apart. You came into church going, I am breaking down. I'm falling apart. I don't know how I'm going to be held together. And the invitation of this passage is to allow Jesus to do in you and for you what you cannot do for yourself. Here's a word of encouragement. For some of you who came into church thinking, I'm falling apart. I'm breaking down. Jesus is here to hold you together. Jesus is here to mend your life. Jesus is here to make you whole. All of life, so much of life is our attempt to be held together. Isn't this why people go to drugs and alcohol and why addictive behaviors emerge? Because when we look at our lives falling apart, life gets hard, amen. Amen. Life gets difficult, and the only thing we can, re, 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 our only recourse is to try to hold ourselves together. So what do we do? We, we go to alcohol. What do we do? We go to drugs. What do we do? We go to distraction. What do we do? We go to busyness. What do we do? We go to overfunctioning. All of these are our attempt to hold ourselves together. And what Paul is reminding us of is and here's the truth of it. You can do all those things and find yourself in a deeper hole by you trying to hold yourself together. And yet the invitation for us is to open ourselves up to the life of Jesus, the, the river that Onaje was talking about to, today, to, uh, to allow ourselves to walk with him and, and talk with him and, and be in the spirit with him so as to open ourselves up to his power. What does this look like? It, it looks like prayer, friends. One of the ways that God holds us together is when we position ourselves to receive from God in prayer. This is why prayer is so important. Prayer is not simply about, I'm going to tell God what I need to do, and, and, and God's going to get it done. Prayer is about union and communion with the living God who holds us together. Isn't this why my hope is that we're living in Scripture? We're living in the Word of God? We're allowing the Word of God to pierce our hearts and give us everything that we need? Why? Because His Word is nutrients. It's nourishment for our soul. The Word of God is nourishment to our lives. It is, it is the Word of God that holds us together in the name of Jesus. This is why we need community. This is why we need others. Because that's how God works through the body of Christ. Holding us together in this way. That's why we need worship. That's why, listen, when our minds get distracted and our minds are now filled with things that are just tearing us apart, we need to fix our minds and fix our hearts and fix our attention and fix our aff affection on Jesus Christ. This is why worship is so important. This is why when you're driving, listen, no one listens to sports talk radio more than I do, but there are times where I realize I'm falling apart. I need to worship. I need to sing. I need to cry out before the living God because it is him, it is Jesus who is before all things and in him all things hold together. I recently came across something that gave me great joy along these lines. I need to tell you from the onset here that, that in high school, I had lots of trouble with chemistry. Yes, I did. Bad, I, I, terrible in chemistry. 
and I had lots of trouble more generally with biology, just as bad at that. But I came across something uh, that made me think about this verse in the realm of biology, in the realm of chemistry. That there's a molecule in our body called laminin, laminin. And because I failed all those classes, this is new information for me, laminin. <laughs> now, what is laminin? I'm glad you asked. Here's what laminin is. Laminins are a family of proteins that are an integral part of the structural scaffolding of basement membranes in almost every animal tissue. I have no idea what that means. I have no idea what that means. And so what you need is a translation, don't you? You need a translation. Here's the translation of what laminin is. They are cell adhesion molecules. Some of you are still like, what are you talking about, Pastor Mitch? <laughs> Which is why there's a street-level translation for this. Here it is. <laughs> Without laminins, our bodies fall apart. Amen. Amen. There it is. You got it? You're good? You feeling all right? Don't you wish you had me as your science teacher? I'd break it down to the street. You break it down to the street. Without laminins, our bodies will fall apart. It's the stuff that holds the membranes of our body together. Now, I know what you're thinking. Pastor Rich, when I come to church, I want to talk about the Savior, not science. I get it. I know what you're saying. But stay with me here, because someone pointed out that, this, that the diagram of the structure of laminin looked quite familiar. The, the structure of laminin looks like a cross. My, my, my. It's shaped in, in, in the cross. It, isn't it something that, that, that the glue that holds our bodies together comes in the shape of a cross? Now, now, now listen, I already told you I failed chemistry. I already told you I failed biology. But if there's something I know about, it is theology. Theology is my jam. Theology <laughs> is my jam. And brothers and sisters, I don't know if when God created the heavens and the earth and, and when God put things into motion and when God was putting in all of our cells and all the molecules, I don't know that he said, if he said, you know, let's put a cross there so that to, to let us know what this, what this molecule is pointing to. I don't know if it's scientific in that way, but this is what I do know. Paul is giving us theology and he's letting us know that this simply is an illustration of something that's true of your life and of my life and the entire world. What's holding this thing together? Jesus Christ. What will hold you together? Jesus Christ. What will hold the world together? Jesus Christ. What's going to hold your family together? Jesus Christ. What's going to hold your mental health together? Jesus Christ. What's going to hold your spiritual life together? Jesus Christ. He is before all things. Amen. And in him, all things hold together. Some of you are falling apart. Good news. You came to church on the right day because there are spiritual laminins that are holding you together. The spiritual laminins of prayer and the spiritual laminins of worship and the spiritual laminins of the body of Christ are holding us together. And so Paul, as he wraps all of this up, he begins to let us know these are the laminins of God, the laminins of Jesus. That he is the head of the body of the church, the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile himself to all things. Whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on a cross. Why can we be held together? Because Jesus Christ, on your behalf, allowed himself to be torn apart. Jesus Christ, on your behalf, allowed himself to fall apart. Jesus Christ took on what should have been us so that he can give us what we could never earn. His mercy, his grace, his love, his salvation, his compassion, everything you need to hold you together. How did you come to church today? Some of you came to church today wondering, I'm falling apart, Pastor Rich. I don't know how I'm going to be held together. 
Oh, but here's the good news. God's holding you together. You are going to make it. You're going to be okay. God is with you. God is for you. He is before all things. And in him, all things hold together. Amen. Let's pray. Amen. Let me invite you to close your eyes. Let's pray. Mm. Many of you came to church today needing strength, needing something that's going to hold you together. The presence of Jesus is here. The Holy Spirit is here. This is not the only way that God holds us together, but this is one way that God holds us together. As we gather and worship, as we lift our voices before the Lord, as we cry out in deep dependence, knowing that in our own strength, we can't hold ourselves together. But in the strength of the Holy Spirit, God can. Lord Jesus, we surrender our lives to you. You are our firm foundation. You are the rock on which we stand. And Lord, I pray that we would get a fresh revelation. That we would continue to deepen our sense of wonder and awe of who you are. That you're more than just a spiritual principle. You're more than just a way. You are the living God who's holding the world together holding our lives together and so Lord in response the only thing we know what to do at this moment is to sing and may our song come from a deep place of worship of dependence of wonder and awe we thank you for your presence in this place and would you break through Lord Holy Spirit would you break through areas of our lives even as we sing give us what we need in this moment we sing to you now. It's in the name of Jesus. We pray, and everyone said, Amen. Amen. Let's all stand and sing together. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand, with everything around me shaking. I've never been more glad. I put my faith in Jesus He never let me die Faithful through generations So why would he fail? I say he won't Amen He won't Let's testify to the truth I still got joy in chaos. Come on. I've got peace that makes no sense. So I won't be going under. I'm not held by my own strength. So I built my life on Jesus. The everlasting. He
He won't. body of Christ, one of the things we do is we strengthen one another. We're not just singing before God, we're singing in the presence of one another. 
And some of you need to be reminded that God won't fail. Can we prophesy over each other? Can you look at your neighbor and say, he won't fail? You're not just repeating a verse. We're prophesying over each other today. Come on, look at somebody else and say, he won't fail. He won't fail. Some of you came to church today, you're falling apart. You're breaking down. Ah, but there's spiritual laminin here. The laminin of the Holy Spirit to hold us together. I want about our prayer team to come to my right, to your left. Now more than ever, we need one another. Now more than ever, we need a deeper reliance on the Holy Spirit. Now more than ever, we need deeper dependence on the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. And one of the ways that that laminin holds us together is through community. That God works in and through community. And our prayer team is here to pray. To offer prayer for some of you that feel like you need some extra strength today. Wherever in your life things are falling apart, we want to pray for you to offer words of peace, words of strength, words of mercy, words of healing over your life. And so at the end of our prayer time, our prayer team will be here. We'd love to pray for you. Maybe today you came to church, maybe you're watching online, and you realize something today. You've been trying to hold yourself together in your own strength and you realize it's just not working and today you you realize in a deeper way your dependence upon Jesus Christ your dependence upon the love of God your dependence upon the, the power of the Holy Spirit you've been trying to do it alone for some of you you've been battling in secret not letting God in not letting others in And you've been trying to do this thing, battle addictions and battle struggles and battle anxiety on your own. And yet today, God is saying, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. I want to pour out on you life and joy and peace. And community is one of the ways that we find that. If you find yourself isolated, alone, we want to help you get connected. If you find yourself discouraged and doubting, we want to pray for you. If you want to surrender your life to Jesus Christ today, and you realize today, I need to surrender my life to Jesus, we want to help you take that next step. You can come up for it for prayer. You can scan the QR code there. One of our pastors would love to follow up with you. You can go downstairs and talk to one of our pastors. We'd be glad to have a conversation with you. But if today you're saying, I need to surrender my life to Jesus Christ. It's a decision I made over 25 years ago. It's a decision that many people have made in this room, and maybe you have not yet. And God is saying, it's your turn today to surrender your life to me, to receive everything that I have for you. Lastly, for some of you, you have said yes to Jesus, but you've never been baptized. You've never taken that next step, which is obedience, by the way. To be baptized is an act of obedience to Jesus, an act of discipleship. And maybe today you're saying, I want to take the next step. We have a baptism class coming up on January 16th. And we have a baptism Sunday in March, at the beginning of March. And so if you're thinking, I want to get baptized with a community of other people on a Sunday in March, you're not doing it alone, you're doing it with a community of people, we want to help you take that next step. You can sign up for that baptism class so that we can help you take your next step of obedience to Jesus Christ, especially for those of you who have said yes to him. As we close our gathering, I want to invite you to open your hands towards heaven to receive a blessing. We end our gathering in this way each time because it's a sign of receiving and we cannot give what we have not received. And so whether you're in this room, whether you're in the shell room right now watching this, whether you are uh, watching this on YouTube, on Facebook, on Instagram, whether you're listening to this on our podcast, with your hands and your hearts in a posture of receiving, brothers and sisters, sons and daughters of the living God, may the Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face to shine upon you and fill you with peace. 
And may you walk out of this building and out of this online gathering in the power of the Holy Spirit, being held together by the love of Jesus, being held together by the strength of the Holy Spirit, being held together by the kindness of God the Father. May the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit hold you together this day and this week. I bless you all in the strong and the beautiful and the resurrected name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And everyone said, amen, amen and amen. Grace and peace to you all.